top side there. That was like you said, the only thing really holding this. Take a good years. look. <clears throat> just caved in a little bit earlier and that's why they had to put these boards up. Behind, I don't know if you can see, there's nothing. There's the air hose. There's Frank laying the drill down. And I am going to very carefully try to scoot down a little at a time. Oh. it straight down. Strength with a bucket of rocks. Can you see the full depth of it over there where Bob is? Pretty far down in there. There's About Bob. Four feet. What is now what is he doing down there, Frank? He's cleaning off, we hope. Right to his right hand side, the face of the cliff goes straight down, and we're hoping that that will be the chamber to the right if we can find our way into it through solid rock right there. Wow. You can't see it too well from where you're at, but it's been plain straight down. Over here to my left is where we had the cave in, where all this oh, is missing. Right there. I don't know if, you can, if this is recording very well or not. It looks like I'm fogged up, but you can see I am in a very confined space. And these guys have been working in here non-stop, day after day. Probably try to find the entrance, because to use a jackhammer with all this loose material would be almost impossible. We've already had one cave in. Yeah. So we'll have to go for finding some way into it. If we can, like a door or some kind of an entrance door. Hmm. It's hard to believe. Okay. I think I probably better call it quits for then. Back up behind me and exit so they can get someone in here to. I didn't go, you know, very far. Yeah. I just went down to about there. Okay. But she did see the wall. Yeah. You can see how small that hole is. I don't know how they got in there. I could hardly get in there. Oh. And there's the air hose, which doubles as the communications line. show you this whole chamber. At times there would be, how many men in here, Dale, at one time? Oh, seven, seven eight. or eight. And I'm looking straight up now. Uh-oh, I hear... Bucket coming up! Oh, bucket. Yeah, now this is what they do. They haul the buckets up, and then... Right, you got the they put them, okay, Dale puts them on, and Ed up there is hoisting it up through the hole, and Simon's grabbing it and handing it to Nathan, and Nathan's giving it to Mark, who's hauling it off to the dump. Pull. Dale, hey, you got any buckets empty out there? Uh, yep. Yeah. One. One down below? Is straight no. down. Ron says about 40 foot down here. See, we're just standing on. We're in a hole. Well, we're standing no, no, no. on boards that have been laid across to the ledges. Oh. Coming down. All right. Oh. That's how the buckets come down. I missed that, but they just tossed them down the hall. First time in 10 months. Well done. That's 
Very good work. We're going to follow Mark over to the bus station. See, what they have to do is every time they get buckets of dirt or rock out of there, they have to walk along this path. Now we're heading towards the bus station where this morning they got tear gas twice. And Ron was over here dumping rock at the time and got got it full force. This is where they dump. You can see it's quite full. We're standing now at the edge of the garden tomb area where the bus station is looking outwards toward, in the direction of the excavation. Now we're walking around and we're going to go up and look at the bus station where all the tear gas came from this morning. Jerusalem is situated on two mountains, Mount Zion on the west and Mount Moriah on the east. Moriah extends from the Temple Mount on the south end and continues beyond the city wall to the north. In ancient times, a dry moat was cut through this mountain to prevent invading armies from easily entering the city from the north. The northern part of the mountain, located outside of the city, was then used at some point in time as a quarry and where the mountain was cut away is very visible. Along the escarpment or cliff face which was formed when it was quarried is located the tomb. Also along this escarpment is the well-known skull face. And between the skull face and the tomb is the site Ron Wyatt pointed to in 1978 when he said that's Jeremiah's Grotto and the Ark of the Covenant is in there. North of the city wall of Jerusalem sits a beautiful garden. Within this garden is the tomb known as the Garden Tomb, chiseled into the rock of the northern part of Mount Moriah.
set this up to uh, resemble what happened to Christ on the cross. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now the cross hole is actually right straight down below where we set this thing up. And of course this is the chamber that you've been looking around through with us as we worked. Now this whole field here needs to be taken out. Now here we have niches. These are where the titles of the criminals that were crucified were placed, the name and what they were accused of. This is one right here. And then there's one right up there. And then of course, there's one right under that rubble right there that we have filmed before. All of that needs to come out and right back directly behind and under all of that rubble is a cross hole right directly below the center line of these niches. And then out from that is a first century Christian church and the massive 13 foot two inch stone that sealed the sepulcher that Christ was buried in is affixed into the wall of that first century church that's buried on this site. And this then is the Calvary Scarp. Our escarpment, the place outside the city, on the north side where most of the traffic passed through, that criminals were executed. What an enormous amount of work this was, and the tremendous difficulties involved. The maze of tunnels seemed endless, as did the many tons of rock and rubble that was removed over the years of work there. He didn't confine his search for the tunnel to the cave system. He believed for various reasons that it most likely had its beginning in Zedekiah's cave, the huge ancient quarry underneath the old city carved out of the southern portion of Mount Moriah. He found a tunnel entrance sealed with blocks which appeared to be heading in the correct direction. Now there's two things that are immediately apparent. One is from the color of that rock. This is the old water channel. Also that you're looking at almost a six foot hole there that's been plugged with those rocks. And it's aimed exactly in the direction that our excavation across the street is located in. Now here's another thing that, that wasn't noticed. This rock right immediately to your left is part of a wall. This right here. See that stone, that stone, that stone, another stone below it. So this was double sealed. And whoever explored the cave in recent times broke through this one, but then they did not break through that second one. And we can assume that there's maybe some more baffles or block areas farther back. Upon opening it, he resealed it. It was not the tunnel he was looking for. Each time Ron and his crew excavated, the entrance to the cave system had to be refilled and the area completely cleaned up before they left. This was a tremendous task, as was reopening it each time they returned. So Ron finally installed a steel door, which could be easily covered and uncovered with dirt and gravel, yet it allowed easy entrance. It also allowed him the ability to enter the system alone without a crew. This same trip, he and the crew built a beautiful retaining wall around the area of ground directly below the cutouts or niches and above the cross holes. Getting a little look at our fancy stonework.
Ron continued to persist and spent every spare moment and every spare dime in his search for the tunnel. Perhaps it was inevitable that the day would come when he became discouraged. Someone uninvited showed up when he arrived to resume work there. In the following, as Ron relates what happened next, the camera battery died unexpectedly, which is why it is edited. And uh, when I arrived at the Jerusalem Hotel, sitting on the front stoop was this medical doctor. He said, <clears throat> Ron, I'm here to help you. Well, bless his heart, he hadn't asked my permission or anything. Said nothing, he just popped up. Well, that makes me rather unlikely to give him the combination to the uh, vault, if you know what I mean. And so, anyway, I was convinced that one of my dumb mistakes had been too many, and that God couldn't use me anymore. So he had sent this fellow there, so I couldn't work on the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, he would have had to share my experiences in order to know what a crushing blow that was. See, I know I'm unworthy. And I thought, okay, finally you messed up and you're out of it. I said a little prayer. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. If there's anything I can help, whoever you want to finish the job, just let me know and I'll do what I can. Well, I couldn't work on the Ark of the Covenant with that guy around, so we volunteered to clean the garden tomb. In the back part of it, there was about a hundred years worth of garbage and one thing and another that had just been thrown back there over the years. So we hauled out of there something like 20 big truckloads of trash. And uh, it was hot that September, blistering hot. And we, I had gotten a little fan to get some air stirring, and the fan died. Well, added on the rest of my miseries, that was almost too much. You know, you remember the story of Jonah and his gourd vine? I could sympathize with him at that point in time. Anyway, I told everybody else, I said, look, just find you a shade somewhere and eat your lunches. And, uh, and I'll try to fix the fan. So I just sat down on the sidewalk. Anyway, I was sitting down there working on this fan, and a voice said to me, God bless you and what you're doing here. So I looked up, and this being was up on this landing, the top of those stairs. Looked exactly like I figured Christ would look, have looked. And the outfit that he had on was not exactly like the Muslims wear today, but it was closer to that than it was anything else I had seen. So I said, are you from around here, sir? And he said, no. And I said, well, then you're a tourist. And he said, no. And I thought, well, he doesn't want to talk with me, obviously. I didn't know what else to say. And then he said, I'm on my way from South Africa to the New Jerusalem. Well, that certainly eliminated a whole lot of possibilities there. Immediately that proved that he was a heavenly being. And I just sat there, couldn't say anything. And he looked at, just continued to look at me. He said, God bless you. And what you're doing here. He was at the top of those stairs. And he walked right back that little short sidewalk, took a right at that big pine tree, and headed for the front gate. Well, this doctor of all people was the only one in earshot. And he was back under some shrubs in the shade eating his lunch, and he piped up and he says, Ron, do you suppose we've been talking with an angel? And I said, at least. Well, I worked with Grant.
great enthusiasm. For the rest of that day, when we left the garden tomb, I asked the ladies in there, I said, what did you think of that big tall man dressed in ancient Jewish garb? They looked at me kind of funny. And they said, there's been nobody in there here like that today. And then one of them said, well, Mr. Wyatt, there's never been anybody in here like that. So somewhere between where he turned right past that pine tree and before he got to the office, he went on to the New Jerusalem. The uninvited guest eventually left and they were able to resume work for a brief time. At this time, Ron made the following discovery. Just a brief look around the surrounding areas here to identify the location of this site. Down to the left, of course, is down where the work's being done in the excavation. As you hear the uh, electric jackhammer. We have been probing around up here by the cross hole and just immediately to the left of the film container you see some dark pigmented material. Now this appears to be dried blood but we do plan to put some of this in the uh, film case and take it back and have it analyzed to see if it is blood. Now this is right under the cutouts where Christ uh, was crucified and near the cross hole that we believe to be the one he was crucified on. Okay, right at the very tip of the uh, Tab. There's some more of this real dark material. As soon as it's exposed to the light, it begins to turn a lighter brown. And this uh, is typical of very old blood. So we'll take some more of this sample here. And it seems to have come down through this area here as we've collected it all the way along and down into this crevice that communicates with the chamber that the Ark of the Covenant's in. It comes right down through here and down this way and around through a crack right in here and down through this area. Anyway, I have a, several samples of it that I have taken. For many years, the specimen sat untouched. Then, in 1996, when Ron was in Great Britain, Richard and Elizabeth Reeves and their sons came to Nashville to our home. Richard had a new, unique, and very powerful microscope he wanted to show us. Leviticus 17, 14 informs us that the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Once again, scientists are finding out that the truths of Scripture are far more literal than they ever imagined. Tiny particles have been discovered in blood that are seemingly indestructible. These tiny particles are less than a tenth of a micron in size, and while they cannot be seen using standard medical microscopes, new methods of microscopy have been developed which makes it possible to see them in their living state. The French scientist Gaston Nasons 
designed special microscope components that would allow him to see these particles, which he entitled somatids, meaning the body that creates. Through experimentation, Professor Nasons found that these somatids contain genetic material yet to be fully understood by the scientific community. They are polymorphic in nature, growing from stage to stage, and are unaffected by high temperatures, extremely toxic chemicals, or even nuclear radiation. Professor Nasons believes these somatids to be subcellular living and reproducing entities, the precursor of DNA, and that they may be the building blocks of life. About six years ago, I learned about these particles as a result of some research that I was conducting, which was totally non-related to archaeology. At that time, I was using a standard medical microscope, and while I could not see these particles, I knew they had to be there. I began to develop my own microscope patterned after the design of Professor Nason's. What you see behind me is that microscope in its latest stage of development. The microscope employs an extremely bright xenon or mercury light source, which can be combined with tungsten light. The light is directed across the microscopic specimen rather than on or through it in what is known as a dark field configuration. The light reflecting off the object is transmitted through the microscope and is magnified over a thousand times. The image is then captured by a sensitive CCD camera and transmitted to a monitor for viewing at screen magnifications of up to 30,000 X. Under these conditions, the tiny living particles can plainly be seen against a dark background. In 1996, my family and I made a trip to Nashville to visit the Wyatts. I brought along the microscope, which at that time was somewhat portable in its early stage of development, and set it up in the basement of the Wyatts' house. One evening, Mary Nell Wyatt asked me to take a look at some material from a burial cave to see if these tiny particles were present. Without my knowledge, one of the samples was actually the blood sample that Ron had taken from the Ark of the Covenant dig. The sample was placed under the microscope, and as the specimen began to come into focus, thousands of tiny particles, somatids if you will, became plainly visible. At that time, Mary Nell, who was standing behind me, began to weep. As I turned around and saw the expression on her face, I realized immediately that the sample we were looking at was actually the sample that Ron had found to be the blood of Christ. Okay, Mary Nell's going to take the sample and uh, mix it with sterile water. In a test tube there that we that'll be enough. Okay. And she's gonna take some sterile water and uh a little bit, just just some drops. All we need, Mary Nell. Okay. okay, so now that we've got the sample on the slide, we'll go ahead and focus into the sample and see what comes up on the screen here. living particles, less than a quarter of a micron in size. The spores are maybe a half micron, and uh, but most of those little particles we're looking at is 17,000 X, magnified on the screen 17,000 times. You know, in the Bible it tells us that the life is in the blood, and there's little living particles that uh, most people are unaware of that are there. And this is the same thing we see in living blood. Uh, the scientist in Canada says that these things never die. Uh, the blood may dry up, uh, but these things, he says, they're indestructible, and he says they are the basis of life.
The results we obtained in no way can be said to be proof that the specimen was the blood of Christ, but based on the location from which the specimen came, we believe it was what Ron believed it was. Years earlier, Ron had taken a blood specimen from the lid of the case which contained the Ark of the Covenant. The blood of Christ is only cried out, folks. It's not dead. When we rehydrated it with normal saline, 72 hours of body temperature with slight, very gentle swirling, and put the white blood cells in a growth medium, 48 hours later, we did a chromosome count. I didn't. This was in Israel. It has 24 chromosomes only. All of us here have 46. Unless, you know, we have, there's a couple of genetic uh, anomalies that make that different. But Christ received 23 from his mother and one Y, sex determining factor from his father who was not a human father because had he received that from a human father, it would have been accompanied by 22 autosomes. Now what this basically means is that his height, his eye color, his hair color, and all of this was supplied from the genes of his mother's gene pool. However, Mary and Joseph both descended from David, uh, but None of us have 24 chromosomes. Well, they knew, and they told me before I asked them to, when I asked them to perform this investigation, that guy had dried blood, you can't get a chromosome count on it because the white blood cells have to be alive and white in order to do that. You can get DNA, you can get some other things, but you can't have a chromosome count. So this blood is unique. <laughs> And it is Christ's blood. And that's why. With no explanations from Ron, the excavation suddenly came to a stop. On a later trip to Jerusalem, Ron entered the cave system alone through the middle door. And for the first time in quite a while, he re-entered the chamber with the Ark of the Covenant. To his utter surprise and disbelief, he found the chamber had been completely cleaned out and all the items from the temple were set up. No longer was the ark in the stone case. The chamber where I found the ark of the covenant has since been perfectly cleaned out. And the ark of the covenant, the table of showbread, the candlestick, the golden altar of incense. They're all set out as they were in the earthly temple, except that the Ark of the Covenant is set, setting against the 12 foot long and 18 foot wide or high wall. He found the original tunnel was also cleaned out and he followed it to discover that it did indeed open into Zedekiah's cave. It was not the tunnel he and his crew had opened earlier, in the following years, Ron entered the chamber with the Ark a number of times. Yes, the tables of stone were found in the Ark of the Covenant. I removed them with the assistance of four angels who lived in the mercy seat, which I would estimate weighs about 900 pounds of solid gold. And one of these angels told me to take the tables of stone out of there. He said, God wants everyone to see those. And so I took them out, backed up, stood there, frozen in place, and I, well, I just can't describe my physical state or mental state or anything else. If, if you know, I didn't have some physical evidence to prove it happened, I think I had a dream or something. But anyway, they're on a stone ledge right in the same chamber. That's where the angel put them after I handed them to him. I didn't know what to do with them. And uh, I was told that these are to be presented with the blood evidence when the mark of the beast law is passed or enforced. 
Now, I know everybody wonders about what it is. The market of the beast, you've heard all kinds of rumors, stories, and all of this. I'll tell you quick and simple. If you keep the Ten Commandments that God wrote upon those tables of stone, and about which he says in Psalms 89 and 34, those of you that are writing down text, you'll want this one. He says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. He spoke the Ten Commandments from the mountaintop. He wrote them in stone. And he says, Nothing will change. Right? If you keep that law, you will receive the seal of God. Soon there will be a set of man-made laws. These man-made laws will require that you break God's Ten Commandments. Christ said of the Pharisees, for it is in vain that they who worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. If you keep those man-made laws, and break God's Ten Commandments, you will receive the mark of the beast. The blood of his son on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Now the mechanics of that, how it happened, is in Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 through 53. It says, when he had cried again, he died the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. Then the earth shook and the rocks were rent and the graves were opened. When the rocks rent, the cliff behind where Christ was being crucified split all the way down, right past the left side of the cross hole and down into the chamber where God had hidden the Ark of the Covenant some 600 years before. And when the centurion pierced, pierced Christ's spleen and probably the left ventricle of the heart, depending on how deep the thrust went, the blood and the, the platelets and serum gushed out and went down through that crack onto the Ark of the Covenant 20 feet below and fulfilled, ratified, if you please, the old and the new covenant. And at that moment, you and I were bought with a price, as was everyone else on this planet. If they will only take advantage of what was done for them. What Christ did was enough to redeem every man, woman, and child that has ever been born on planet Earth. The tragedy is that so few avail themselves of that wonderful gift. Now, the next morning, and this is in Matthew chapter 28, it says, the angel descended to roll back the stone, and there was a great earthquake. I believe that God closed the crack at that point in time because there's no evidence of any surface water, rain, or dirt, dust, anything else having fallen through that crack other than just the blood of Jesus. And there it remained for almost 2,000 years. But the ark was sitting there 600 years before the blood actually went on. Appreciate the time you all have shared with me here. When I get to heaven, I'm going to look around and I want to see every one of you there.
got uh, the braces it's are being too, set now? It's too dangerous. I hope they will do roofing or something like that. Yeah. Can we go do the shoring tonight? Over a week into the excavation, the team had just reached the point where research could begin. After meeting with Yehiel, permission was granted for the necessary shoring to be installed in the evening hours. Time was of the essence and dinner could wait. As dimensions are radioed to the surface, pieces are cut to length and pass through the narrow openings for assembly in the caverns below. Good. Okay. Got another one? Another board? Another board. Uh, take it, uh, well, we have our stuff on the shelf. Take it up above that shelf and it'll float all the way back over there. You put it down in that hole. I got too many bodies in the way here. Hang on. Working under an extremely fragile ceiling, the shoring roof is lifted into position. Once in place, adjustable steel jack screws would be inserted into and attached to notches in the wooden beams. Soon, the work could continue under somewhat more secure conditions. Until that time, one could not help but ponder the gigantic boulders above their heads. That one is a big one, really. Oh, yeah. We took this down from about right here. When we when we first came in, it was about right here. What did you say? Up there on the top. More even a lot higher than more. that. Okay. Is that what Gary's speaking? <laughs> anyway, higher than this when we came in. We've taken it down to here. We started back the other way cleaning. We cleaned down to bedrock all the way down to here. There was a rope coming around here, and that rope is in the video well, when Rod took the coming. blood sample. <laughs> we have a crevice that exactly matches our pictures we've been showing people for 15, 20 years. The angles are right. In the video when Ron takes the blood sample, we see this rope. The rope has been in exactly the right place. Uh, we know this is the chamber, not anywhere else, not up higher. We know this is it because of what we see in the video. Uh, and Marianelle knows now that when Ron told her she was sitting on top of it, where it was, and Ron says, and right down there is where they're working, and points right down here to the there. So we know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is the room, this is the angles, and this is the place. Now we're I mean, our no top. Okay. Okay, and uh, it's either December of 88 or January of 89 when I came in here and filmed. Um, I came in through the hole, which is directly behind you, and I sat approximately where you are right now and filmed. Okay. And, and that's the video. There's the hole. That's the video that's in our Ark of the Covenant video. And I'm sitting and here. And Frank Sheffield was sitting about right here. Okay. And this was, if I remember correctly, there was a little more space there, but not much. But anyhow, I was filming, and I'm looking around. I'm filming down here. And at one point, uh, let's see, Bob Merle was down here, and I scooted down here, and I put my foot on this. I, I remember that. And filmed. He said, don't hang really home, Take a good look. <coughs> just caved in a little bit earlier and that's why they had to put these boards up. Behind, I don't know if you can see, there's nothing. There's the air hose. There's Frank laying the drill down. And I am going to very carefully try to scoot down a little at a time. Oh. straight down. Strength with a bucket of rocks. Can you see the full depth of it over there where Bob is? Pretty far down in there. Here's About another Bob. four feet.
What is now? What is he doing down there, Frank? He's cleaning off. We hope right to his right hand side. But the face of the cliff goes straight down, and we're hoping that that will be the chamber to the right if we can find our way into it through solid rock right there. You wow. can't see it too well from where you're at, but it's been plain straight down. I'm as sure as I can be that this is it. This, it's like Richard said. I see this edge here. We've got some other pictures that if we could, one especially that's on, on my computer, if we could just get a power source. Here we see a photograph of the crevice adjoining the area Ron described as a cross hole. This picture was taken during our recent excavations. In this view, we have overlaid a scale in inches based on the measurements that I took off the crevice. In this view, we see the original photograph of the cross hole and crevice taken by Ron Wyatt. Based on the dimensions of the cross hole plug, which we have, we have overlain the same scale and have sized the photograph in accordance with that scale. The proportions were not changed. Only the size was changed to adjust for the difference in the distance from the camera to the object from one picture to another. As you can see, when we fade from one photograph to the other, the shape and scale of what is seen in both photographs is identical. Notice a prominent feature of the crevice. As we fade in and out, once again, the details are identical. Here we have outlined the outer edge of the cross hole. By superimposing that outline on the recent photo, we can see a perfect match in every case. Ron's chisel marks are another consideration. Here they're seen in the recent photo. Basically, all this time we've been looking at a, a, a flat picture made with a Polaroid camera when all of this debris was even, ground level. And that's what Ron, you know, when he first came in here. And now that it's been excavated away and he's worked in here for, you know, many years after that, um, we all had a different concept. I know some people really had a different concept. But I'm as sure as I, I mean, every little notch in here. I've been looking at that, those pictures for, for a long time and the notches in here and this, this wall here, the angle, it's, it's exactly what we've been looking at. It's exactly what Ron told us it was. You can see the rope coming down this very same rope we've followed it all the way down here and you can plainly see these marks going across it right there you can see, I mean it's, everything is in detail this indentation the angles on the stones uh, you know I guess somebody could say well they could be two just alike but that'd be like having two that'd people be a with the same fingerprints very good right so on. it's agreed uh, with the people in this room that the, this is the spot that's and, agreed with me. Okay, Mary Nell agrees. Right. I agree. And Richard agrees. I agree. Okay. Yeah. That's literally the zero zero before the country code when placing sunlight calls. In the United States, Ron has artifacts and information on display from his fieldwork. <coughs> For example, from Sodom and Gomorrah is this burnt spearhead and this burnt bone. From the Red Sea crossing site is a horse's hoof 
and from Jerusalem are items found at the crucifixion site. We also met up with some of Ron's close associates. Oh no! <laughs> Hey! Maybe wait in the car. That's right. You wanted to know something over something from a few days ago. Are you videotaping this? I am now. Okay, good. Okay, what this is, is it's a stalactite, which is approximately 11 to 12 inches long. And this was the stalactite that was hanging down in front of the chamber, or the entrance into the chamber where Ron first entered and found the Ark of the Covenant and he broke it off and you can see where it's broken right here if you can get that in the, in the proper light you can see where it's broken off he broke that off so that the little air boy that was with him could get into the chamber and of course I believe later if I remember the story correctly he had to enlarge the hole a little bit so he could get in but this is the stalactite from that cave now tell us what this is let me put this away the seal stone that was in the cross hole that we believe held the cross of Christ. And they used these seal stones to plug the hole when it wasn't being used so that in between uses it wouldn't fill up with debris and everything because uh -huh. then you couldn't get anything in it. And a, and a, a 12 inch square hole would be very difficult to, to, uh, right. to dig the, the, uh, the debris and everything out. It was approximately about two Two and a half feet deep. I think it was 28 inches, something like that. Okay. Do you know which way up it went? Was it this way up or? I believe. Or this way up. I believe it was like this, and the reason I say that is because you can see uh, the seepage here. It's kind of a concretion where it was oh, sitting yeah. like this, and the moisture uh -huh. formed on the bottom. Okay. But that's just a speculation on my part. I believe it was that like this. Okay. And it's. 12, approximately 12 inches by 13 inches. It's not quite square. It's a little bit longer this way than it is that way. And that fit securely in the hole? So that the yeah, in fact, on the uh, video, you can see it sitting in the hole. Okay. I believe in one of the video shots. So the upright beam for the cross, that's about the rough dimensions it would have been? It would have been approximately, yeah, pro probably about 12 by 12. Okay. Ron's work in Turkey led to government recognition of the site of Noah's Ark. Ron has some significant artifacts from this site. This is deck timber that was taken from near the back of Noah's Ark. Ron found this on the, uh, uh, the radar scan and uh, they dug it up. It's been tested. It contains organic carbon, which is consistent with what you find in petrified wood. Now, one of the unique things about this, if we can get it in the light just right, this is actually a piece of deck board that's been laminated. There are three separate layers. You can see one right here. It's a larger center section, and it's a little darker in color. And then a bottom section here, three different layers. This area right here appears to be a silica replacement of, of the glue that was used to glue these boards or laminate these boards together and some of it has seeped out the side. Now another interesting feature of this deck board is nails, oh, okay. nail heads. Or, there's one right here. Let me get it into the light and see it a little bit better. And you can you can experiment with your camera angle. There's one here, uh, and there's uh, one, two, three in a row right here. Marty Plot also has a section of fossilized wood from Noah's Ark. So Ron gave you this. Yeah, and this is from Noah's Ark. It is from Noah's Ark. My shoes in the car. Okay. It's part of an old boat, probably the oldest on the planet. <laughs> Ron also has some ancient human bones of gigantic proportions. This first one is a human thumb bone, and um, it's the, been identified by radiologists as the second bone of the thumb, this, this bone right here. The Bible records that giants existed in ancient times. 
as you can see, it's approximately two and a half times the size of mine, which if you can extrapolate from that, this person was probably somewhere between 11 to 12 feet tall that this bone belonged to. Now, the bone of a child, the, what is it? The epiphysis. The epiphysis is still uh, visible here. Uh, that's what you find on a bone that has not completely grown, and you find this in children. And as you can see, as I hold it up here, it's just a little bit larger than mine, but mine is full grown. So this was a rather large child. Now this third specimen, unlike the other two, is petrified. And this was found near the Tower of Babel and it is, has been identified as a human toe bone, probably from the big toe. And uh, as you can see, it's quite large. It's bigger than any toe. This would just be one of two bones in the toe, so you're talking about a toe that's probably uh, six to seven inches long. That was a big toe. That was somebody with a very big foot. <laughs> from Noah's Ark, Ron retrieved a metal alloy rivet. What this is is a, a rivet that was found in association with Noah's Ark. What's re two remarkable things is you can see the edge of the plate right here where it ends. And you can also see part of the, the head of the rivet and where, as Ron says, it was struck while it was hot and the hot metal flared out and made it larger than the hole so it wouldn't slide back through plate. When I was over there in June of 97, Andrew Jones and I found and photographed uh, two, uh, actually a whole plate with two rivets in it that had rust stains all around them. Uh -huh. You know, uh, we have that on both photograph and video. And these things are real and they look very, very similar to this. Th this is a very distinct separation here. Mm -hmm. In fact, I imagine you would still see if you chip some of this matrix material off. But you see it's broken. And here's some broken pieces of it right here, see? Mm -hmm. But we won't, we won't attempt to remove those. Because they look very fragile, so yeah, please don't. We were with him when he found the Josh and Noah. Oh, that's right. You were on that trip, weren't you? I had that on video at the spot. Ron had survived imprisonment and even a kidnapping at gunpoint during his explorations. But poor health finally caught up with him. Ron had planned to dive with us at the Red Sea and regretted having to cancel his trip. Uh, you know, I was sorry that I couldn't go diving with you guys because, you know, but I couldn't. And I've you know, learned to quit apologizing for things that are out of my control because there's obviously some reason for it. Ron had been battling with cancer for some time. Sadly, in the early hours of the 4th of August, 1999, Ron passed away and is now resting in the Lord. <laughs>